And as they leave, please join me in prayer. O oh God, put a hand on our shoulder and point us in the right direction. Put our hand on someone's shoulder and let it matter. Amen. On Friday, the new iPhone 8 went on sale in stores. Someone tweeted with a touch of humor, anyone have plans to stare at their phone somewhere exciting this weekend? <laughs> There's usually a palpable buzz in Apple Universe whenever a new phone is released, but the buzz has been a bit muted this time. This time, as Daniel Victor of the New York Times writes in his review of the iPhone 8, most reviewers were hesitant to offer full-throated endorsements of the new phone. According to Reuters, the launch of the iPhone 8 was muted around the world with less fanfare than is typical. Gone were the blocks long lines of eager consumers waiting to purchase the new device in cities from San Francisco to Shanghai to London. And shares in Apple stock actually dropped 1.3% on release day. One reviewer admitted that the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus rank head and shoulders above their competition with a newer, faster camera, double the storage capacity, and an all-glass back that allows for wireless charging. If you don't speak Apple, all of this means that the iPhone 8 is pretty awesome. But as Steve Kovach wrote in his review in the Business Insider, for the first time in the 10-year history of the iPhone, I can't recommend buying the newest model. The reason for this hesitancy, this lack of the usual buzz in Apple world over the iPhone 8 is that a much cooler iPhone is coming out in November, the iPhone 10 with a Roman numeral X. This phone will cost $1,000. One astute person pointed out on Twitter that the price tag of this phone is more than the entire menu at Cracker Barrel, which apparently is only $887. <laughs> to be fair though, the iPhone 10 does look pretty fabulous from the press release on Tuesday with its bigger and better screen technology, a face recognition system called Face ID, and augmented reality capabilities. But is it worth a grand? Thus the dilemma for iPhone users who want to upgrade buy the less expensive iPhone 8 now, or wait until November to buy the even cooler iPhone 10, but spend more money on it than you would on a new computer or on the entire menu at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> this dilemma is what some might call a first world problem. I was struck this week by the almost obscene paradox between, on the one hand, this Apple world, first world dilemma of iPhone 8s and 10s that blanketed social media, and on the other, the various tragedies that have been in the news, hurricanes and earthquakes and the brinkmanship with North Korea. And then there's our own various sufferings from cancer to grief to healing from the pain of the past. On the one hand, people are planning thousand dollar phone purchases, and on the other, People are suffering terribly with no power, no clean water, no homes, surgeries, regret, depression, addiction, and millions more may suffer in the event of war. This paradox, this incongruity, is like what writer Christopher Hitchens once called life's repeated contradictions. What Hitchens calls keeping two sets of books. I am forced Hitchens wrote while losing his battle with cancer, to make simultaneous preparations to die and to go on living, lawyers in the morning and doctors in the afternoon. In one set of books, so to speak, there's awareness of pain, sometimes our own, and in the other, there's our daily living in relative safety and relative peace as we shop and eat and work and play, surrounded by the natural beauty of Ithaca, immersed in our lively culture with a university and a college, good restaurants, wineries, and changing leaves. How to navigate a world of such paradoxes as people of faith. In her TED Talk, writer Emily Esfahani Smith frames this issue a bit differently. She focuses on happiness. Can we be happy in such a world? 
A world where we renovate a home in Ithaca while knowing that people in Houston have lost their homes entirely. A world where people puzzle over the color of their new iPhone while entire islands in the Caribbean are in ruins. Smith says in her TED Talk, I used to think the whole purpose of life was pursuing happiness. Everyone said the path to happiness was success. So I searched for that ideal job, that perfect boyfriend, that beautiful apartment. But instead of ever feeling fulfilled, I felt anxious and adrift. And I wasn't alone, she says. My friends, they struggled with this too. Eventually, she continues, I decided to go to graduate school to learn what truly makes people happy. But what I discovered there changed my life. The data show that chasing happiness can make people unhappy. And what really struck me was this. Even though life is getting objectively better by nearly every conceivable standard, more people feel hopeless, depressed, and alone. There's an emptiness gnawing away at many people. Sooner or later, I think we all wonder, is this all there is? Is this all there is? A world of two books or paradoxes, iPhones on the one hand and Hurricane Irma's on the other, how to live as people of faith in such a world. I'll return to Emily Esfahani Smith's TED Talk in just a bit. We aren't the first people to keep two sets of books or to wrestle with life's repeated contradictions, as Hitchens once called it. In today's reading from Exodus, the Israelites are caught between two realities. The one is the blessed spiritual experience of deliverance from slavery in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea and all that, when the nation was set free from centuries of slavery, the dramatic story of salvation we've been reading together over the last couple, last few weeks. And on the other is their new reality, marked by the daily drudgery of wandering in the wilderness toward a promised land that never seemed to arrive. We enter today's story as the Israelites have been trekking for a month across the desert. Once wonderfully blessed, but now depressed as those memories of past deliverance began to fade, and the is this all there is question emerged as the reality of hungry bellies and sore feet began to dawn. Earlier in the book of Exodus, we're told that when the Israelites departed Egypt, they took livestock, flocks and herds, and much bread. But a month into their journey, the provisions had run thin because there were so many mouths to feed, forcing God to provide manna, heavenly bread, to keep them alive. 600,000 military-age men, besides women and children, left Egypt, according to Exodus, putting the total number of Israelites at close to 2.5 million people. This number is almost certainly exaggerated. There is no evidence that a group that large was ever enslaved in Egypt, nor that a group that large speaking a Semitic language ever trekked for 40 years across the Sinai Peninsula. 2.5 million refugees would have left a substantial archaeological record behind, but none has been found by modern archaeologists. The numbers in this story, like the details in so many of these ancient epic tales, grew larger in the telling and retelling. An exodus happened in history, but not quite in the same way that the Bible describes. Let me speak personally for a moment. There once was a time in my own journey of faith when this reality about the Bible's exaggerations bothered me. A time when I needed to believe that everything in the Bible was historically accurate. I used to worry that if a minor historical detail like the number of Israelites leaving Egypt was wrong, then how could I trust a bigger detail like, for example, the resurrection? I've since matured in my understanding of Scripture's role in my journey of faith, or to use the words of St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians, I've since put those younger ways behind me. Over the years, I've come to see the Bible as a guide as a map for the journey of faith, an ancient repository, a library that houses the experiences of faith of countless people over the centuries, a resource that points a way based on the life experiences of those who've gone before. The Bible is a place to start a conversation, as we say in the UCC. It's not 
the final word. Its layered, textured beauty is rich and inexhaustible. It can be engaged, argued with, trusted, questioned. Or as one Bible scholar put it, we take the Bible seriously, but not literally. So one way to read today's story, a story we might take seriously, but not literally, is as an illustration about keeping those two sets of books that Hitchens describes, going on living in a world of iPhones and Irmas, shopping and suffering. Reading the manna story a bit more closely, I think the Israelites struggled with more than just empty bellies or sore feet or hot sun beating down upon them in the wilderness. They lost perspective. They lost a sense of meaning and purpose. Let me return to Emily S. Fahani Smith's TED Talk. According to the research, she says, what predicts despair is not a lack of happiness. It's a lack of something else, a lack of having meaning in life. Our culture is obsessed with happiness. But in graduate school, I came to see that seeking meaning is the more fulfilling path. And the studies show that people who have meaning in life are more resilient. They do better in school and at work, and they even live longer. At the beginning of their article titled From Purpose to Impact, which appeared in the Harvard Business Review, Nick Craig and Scott Snook quote Mark Twain, who once said, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. I think the Israelites lost perspective while wandering in the wilderness. They got stuck in their circumstances and couldn't move forward. They lost faith. They lost that sense of meaning, of purpose, of why. Not that hungry bellies or sore feet or baking sun or another round of chemotherapy or another wave of grief or another phone call from a drug-addicted family member or another tragic news story or another encounter with a bully or another sense of regret about the past, not that any of these are insignificant. They are reality for many, for most, for all of us. At some point in life, we all will walk through, as the psalmist once said, shadowy valleys. Faith gives us perspective. Faith helps us make meaning in the midst of those valleys. Faith opens a whole other set of books for us to return to that comment by Christopher Hitchens. Faith empowers us to move forward. Faith is a trust that there is another out there, all around and moving through us. Our tradition calls him, calls her God, who is the spirit in our breath, the inspiration in our creations, who feels the pain of our grief, who is a presence that shadows us, dropping bits of manna along the road of our lives, reminding us that he, she is there, has always been there, will always be there as we move through a world of paradoxes, of iPhones and Irmas, faith, as theologian Catherine Keller says, helps us step with trust into the next moment, into the unpredictable. I want to close with two stories about the power of making meaning. One is told by Emily S. Fahani Smith in her TED Talk, and the other is told by Douglas Abrams in his book, which recounts a conversation between the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a book that I'll refer to again next week. First, Smith's story about her dad. I remember a powerful experience I had with my father. Several months after I graduated from college, my dad had a massive heart attack that should have killed him. He survived, and when I asked him what was going through his mind as he faced death, he said all he could think about was needing to live so he could be there for my brother and me, and this gave him the will to fight for life. When he went under anesthesia for emergency surgery, instead of counting backwards from 10, he repeated our names like a mantra. He wanted our names to be the last words he spoke on earth if he died. My dad is a carpenter and a Sufi. It's a humble life, but a good life. Lying there facing death, he had a reason to live. 
his sense of belonging within his family, his purpose as a dad, his transcendent meditation, repeating our names. These, he says, are the reasons why he survived. That's the power of meaning. Happiness comes and goes. But when life is really good and when things are really bad, having meaning gives you something to hold on to. Now for the second story, told by Archbishop Desmond Tutu about Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, he says, went to prison and was a very angry man. He had been commander-in-chief of the military wing of the African National Congress. He believed firmly that the enemy had to be decimated, and he and his comrades had been found guilty in a travesty of justice. He entered prison aggressive and angry. He went to Robben Island and was mistreated. Prisoners there didn't have beds. They were sleeping on the floor, no mattress, just a thin little thing. These were sophisticated, educated people. They were made to go and dig in a quarry, and they were wearing very inadequate clothing. Mandela and all of them wore shorts, even in the winter. They were made to do almost senseless work, breaking rocks and sewing post office bags. He was a highly qualified lawyer, and there he was, sitting and sewing. It must have frustrated him to no end, made him very angry. After 27 years, he emerged on the other side as someone of immense magnanimity because in an extraordinary way, his suffering helped to grow him. Where they thought it was going to break him, it helped him. 27 years later, he came out kind, caring, ready to trust. Suffering can either embitter us or ennoble us. The difference lies in whether we're able to find meaning in our suffering. Having faith or a trust to step into the next moment, as theologian Catherine Keller says, won't numb pain, the pain of hurricanes or illness or death. What it will do, and I'm convinced of this, what it will do is give us perspective and help us make meaning in a world of paradoxes. Amen.